here that's kind of not really nice and classic ways and we don't get in trouble or anything. So I tried to do that back to very nice. So anyway, um, so that's where we are. Now, one of the things I didn't talk about yesterday because I decided I wanted to keep it um, relatively simple for you was A, we went through a lot of material yesterday and uh, B, I felt like you had enough material for the exam that we didn't need to uh, add on to that list. But there's another type of plot that we do with enzymes uh, relative to their kinetic properties that I want to discuss with you because it is a um, very important one. It actually helps us to make it easier to calculate things like Vmax, KM, and uh, to see what type of inhibition that we have. And so you actually saw it briefly yesterday. You heard it in song yesterday where the song talks about line weaver birth plots. And so that's what I'm going to be uh, talking about to start with uh, here today, line weaver birth plots. So let's go um, and talk uh, briefly about those. Um, let's see. Okay, so. Okay, so this plot that you look that you see looks very different from the plots that I talked about yesterday. All the plots I talked about yesterday, what we call V versus S, are velocity uh, versus substrate concentration. And I told you that to get the data for those plots, I took 20 tubes. They all had the same amount of enzyme. They all had the same buffer, and they all reacted for the same amount of time, but they had varying amounts of substrate concentration. And so those varying amounts of substrate concentration gave us different velocities, and we plotted uh, substrate concentration versus velocity. We got that hyperbolic curve. But one of the things you probably saw that hyperbolic curve was it wasn't apparent just eyeballing it where that Vmax actually was. Did so I get it right? Was it my too high, my too low? I have to make a bit of a guess about where that Vmax actually is. So the line of birth plot is designed to help us to see that Vmax much easier. That's one thing. The other thing is that by knowing Vmax more precisely or more easily, we can determine Km more easily. So how do we do a plot like you see on the screen? Well, as I said, this plot is called Lineweaver-Burke. It's spelled L-I-N-E-W-E-A-V-E-R-B-U-R-K, Lineweaver-Burke. And Lineweaver-Burke plots are also called double reciprocal plots. So double reciprocal plots um, derive their name from the fact that the axes are inverted compared to what we saw before. So what does that mean? Well, if we had axes that went 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, our inverted plots would have 1 over 100, 1 over 90, 1 over 80, 1 over 70, 1 over 60, et cetera, going up. So we have the inverted values of those for both the y-axis and the x-axis. Similarly, we take our data and we invert it. So if our data had values of, let's say, a velocity of 4 um, micromolar per second, we would have an inverted velocity of 1 over 4 per second. If we had a substrate concentration of 10 millimolar, we would have an inverted concentration of 1 over 10. Right? So basically, we take the same exact data that we did for a V versus S, and we invert everything. We invert the values, and then we plot those inverted values. We plot them on a, double, a, a, a plot that has the axes with the values themselves inverted. Well, why do we do that? The reason we do that is we mathematically transform hyperbolic um, curves into straight lines. And so, as you look here, those values that I had for my um, experiments all show up in this quadrant right up here. Okay? They all show up in this quadrant. You'll notice that this quadrant is corresponding to the positive values. And that makes sense because I can't have a negative substrate concentration. But I can, in fact, line those positive values up, draw a line through them, and extrapolate down to the negative side and see where that line intersects the x-axis. Now, my reason for doing this is as that line crosses the two axes, it gives us those two parameters that we would 
want to know very uh, precisely. First, when we look on the y-axis, the place where the line crosses the y-axis has the value of 1 over v max. So if that 1 over v max value was 1 over 4, if 1 over 1 over 4, I would get 4. So I could determine the v max quite readily by simply inverting the value of the place where it places. Similarly, the x-axis, uh, uh, the place where the line crosses the x-axis, has a value of minus 1 over km. And so again, if I came up with a value of minus 1 over 10, then I would have a km of 10. Um, and that uh, gives me those values very visually, very easy to see, and very easy to determine without any question that I draw the line in the right place and all that sort of stuff. So line number Burke plots are very, very useful uh, for us to be able to understand and actually calculate some of the parameters uh, of enzyme kinetics that I talked about yesterday. Okay? Questions on this? Are your brains in gear yet, or are you thinking about the exam tomorrow? Okay. Um, the bottom line is not doing any separate experiments. You're just taking the same data, inverting all that data, and plotting that inverted data on here. Now, um, I showed you, or at least described to you yesterday, what happens if I take and I have different inhibitors of enzymatic reactions. For example, what if I had uh, a competitive inhibitor? We, just, we described yesterday that a competitive inhibitor would not affect the Bmax, but it would affect the KM. It would, in fact, increase the KM because it was taking more enzyme out of action. If we uh, had non-competitive inhibition, we didn't affect the KM, but in fact we lowered the Vmax. And that had uh, an important um, uh, consideration for us. Well, we can take that very same information and we can think about how it would look on a line weaver birth plot and plot it in comparison, come on, plot it in comparison uh, to an uninhibited reaction. And so that's what I'm going to show you here. If I look at a competitive um, inhibitor. Okay. What I see in black is the line I would expect to get if there were no inhibitor present. Okay. So again, this is just like we saw on the, on the last graph. It gives a straight line. Uh, the y-intercept is 1 over Vmax, and the x-intercept is minus 1 over Km. Well, from just the information that you had yesterday that the Vmax does not change, you would already know one point for the non or I'm sorry, for the competitive inhibitor. And that one point would be right here. You know the Vmax doesn't change, and so one of the Vmax isn't going to change either, so those two lines are going to cross at that point. But what about the KM value? Well, if we think about what I said yesterday with the KM value, the KM value will actually increase. And if the KM value increases, then minus 1 over Km actually gets closer to zero. You can place plugs and numbers and convince yourself of this fact. But in fact, what happens is that the Km moves from the place where it was for the uninhibited to a, a value closer to zero for the inhibited reaction. If you had no more information than that, all right, you would know what this line is, okay? Because two points define a line. There's one point there. There's one point there. So if I had asked you on an exam, which I might, to sketch out what it would look like if you had a competitive inhibitor compared to a, um, an uninhibited reaction, what a line weaver Burke plot might look like, it would look like this. Okay? So again, and this is a very visual display. You could look at this and say, oh, wow, I've got a competitive inhibitor. And this is actually very useful information. If you've got something that's inhibiting your enzyme and you don't know the mechanism by which it's working, you could perform these experiments, plot your data, and tell very quickly, do I have a competitive inhibitor or do I have a non-competitive inhibitor? Well, let's think about what happens with a non-competitive inhibitor. We have some different parameters that change. One of the parameters that changes in a non-competitive inhibitor is the Vmax. Vmax decreases. And the Km, in fact, stays the same. So we can think about what that plot would look like um, for a second and before I actually plot it and show you. So if we think about what that plot looks like, the KM stays the same. We know the two lines must both intersect the same point 
on the x-axis because that's where minus 1 over km is. The km does not change for non-competitive inhibition. Now, the only question then is, does the line go above the un uninhibited or does it go below the uninhibited? What do you think? The next goes down. Is that? It goes above. And the reason why does it go above? It's 1 over. So the reciprocal of, some, of, of a decrease is an increase. And so when we look at the Langweber birth plot for a non competitive inhibitor, we see the non competitive inhibitor actually is above the line for the um, competitive, for, for the, uh, the um, uninhibited reaction. Does that make sense? Good. I must be getting too clear in my old age. We'll see how clear I am with a heavy exam, I guess, huh? Okay. Well, when we talk about enzyme uh, inhibition, we uh, think that there are many factors, of course, that affect enzymes. We've seen that we have, in some cases, uh, substrates that look like the inhibitor. In that case, we had a competition for the active site. The competitive inhibitors resembled the regular inhibitor. We also saw that we had non-competitive inhibitors with these inhibitors bound to enzymes and uh, affected the active site, but they didn't compete for the active site. Those were non-competitive inhibitors. In both cases, those inhibitors were reversible inhibitors. I mentioned that yesterday. I made a point of it yesterday. And it's important that they be reversible inhibitors. Not all things that affect enzymes are reversible. So I'm going to tell you now about a couple of things that we can do to enzymes that affect their activity with non-reversible uh, types of interactions, okay? The first of these is a, a chemical called uh, DIPF. And what DIPF does is it reacts with the side chains of serines in proteins. So here's the chemical. You don't need to know the structure. The DIPF is a chemical reagent that, that covalently binds to serines. Let's imagine for a moment that uh, that serine in this, in this uh, acetylcholinesterase is in the active site. And let's imagine for a moment that that serine plays an important role in the catalytic action of that enzyme. If DIPF covalently binds to that serine, we would predict that in fact the enzyme would lose its activity or maybe have some very odd, bizarre activity as a result of it. And in fact, that's exactly what happens. So now we've seen that we've got a chemical tool that we could use to ask the following question. Are there serines in the active site that are essential? Because if they are, and I treat this enzyme with DIPF, I would expect that those essential serines would get knocked out. Now, you might think that any serine that it reacts with would cause the enzyme to become inactive, and the answer is that's not necessarily true. Ones in the active site definitely are going to stop the enzyme because they obviously the serine plays an important role for many enzymes. But we can imagine that there might be serines, for example, on the exterior part of the enzyme that aren't part of the active site, that DIPF might react with, and though it might change the shape of the enzyme slightly, it might not have a major effect on its activity, and that's exactly right. So it's hard to predict other serines the effect that they will have. Some of them may have an effect, some of them may not have an effect, but I can always say that if it's in the active site and the serine is important, it will inhibit the enzyme, and it's inhibiting it not irreversibly. That is, the DIPF is covalently bonding to that serine side chain and not coming off. Now, this differs significantly from competitive inhibition in two ways. One, it's a covalent bond. Okay? It's a covalent bond. Number two, this would not behave, even if it were a uh, non-covalent bond, this would not behave like a um, competitive inhibitor necessarily because DIPF doesn't necessarily resemble the, um, uh, so the normal substrate. And we can't measure that because, of course, it is covalently bound, and once we kill the enzyme, it doesn't come back. So there's no way of measuring the kinetics of a dead enzyme, which is what this would be. 
And suffice it to say that DIPF is um, a very fundamentally different thing from a competitive inhibitor. Okay. Now, another uh, type of inhibition is iodoacetate inhibition. And with iodoacetate, what we see is it will react with the side chains of serines. Here are the SH groups, and the SH groups will covalently bind to iodoacetamide and thereby knock that enzyme out of action. So, again, if we have a cysteine that is in the active site of the enzyme and it's critical for the enzyme's function, treatment of that enzyme with iodoacetamide will, in fact, uh, inhibit that enzyme and stop it from functioning. Okay? So these types of inhibitors make covalent bonds and, as they say, completely wipe out the enzyme. So we really can't study the enzyme's kinetics because, again, we simply have a dead enzyme when that happens. Okay, now, these two inhibitors that I just described here are what we just would describe as just general chemical inhibitors. Right? They will work on virtually any enzyme that has any of these groups as part of their active site. But there's a subclass of the covalently binding enzymes that I want to talk about, and these are called suicide inhibitors. Now, these suicide inhibitors would, in fact, very much resemble a competitive inhibitor. They're designed to. They're designed to look like the competitive inhibitor and as a consequence bind where the competitive inhibitor would bind, covalently link to the enzyme and stop the enzyme from functioning. So why would I want to have one of these compared to one of the other ones? Well, if I'm designing a drug and I want the drug to knock out, let's say, an enzyme in a bacterium and not have it interfere with my own enzymes. I want something that is only going to be bound by the protein or the enzyme of the bacterium. And so if I can design my inhibitor such that it resembles the normal thing that the bacterial enzyme binds, and my cells don't have that, I just designed an antibiotic. So one of the antibiotics that's designed, uh, it wasn't actually designed, it was actually discovered, but one of the enzymes that has this very important property um, is penicillin. This is not penicillin, unfortunately, but penicillin um, has a structure that resembles uh, a, a molecule that the um, enzyme in bacteria is used to make bacterial cell walls. It makes what's called peptidoglycan backbone. You don't have to worry about that. But suffice to say that Bacteria, bacterial cell wall uses this enzyme. Our cells don't have cell walls, don't, don't use that enzyme. And so by designing an inhibitor that's specific to that enzyme and bacteria and binding to it, we can kill, we can selectively kill bacteria with the enzyme without having major impacts on us. Now, yes, there are other things that happen in us. There's virtually no chemical you can put in the body that won't have some sort of effect. Some people are allergic to penicillin uh, and so forth. But suffice it to say that, by and large, penicillin actually does a very, very good job of uh, inhibiting enzymes. I put the wrong figure here, so this is not the one I was going to show you. But um, in any event, the penicillin is a, is a great example of a suicide inhibitor. Here's the penicillin down here. We can see what happens in the process of penicillin's action is that uh, penicillin actually makes uh, a covalent um, So penicillin resembles the substrate that, uh, that, that the um, uh, enzyme in the bacteria make. And I should point out that when I talked about amino acids in the very first part of the class, I talked about the fact that 99.99% of the amino acids we find in nature are in the L configuration. And one of the exceptions to that rule is actually on this figure right here. Okay? The exception is that bacteria, when they make the backbone of their cell wall, they actually use D-amino acids. They use D-alanine. Now, why do they use D-alanine? Well, the cell wall of the bacterium gives protection. It gives some structural integrity to the bacteria. And since they use D-amino acids, proteases won't touch them. 
So bacteria have evolved a mechanism to protect their cell walls against proteolytic degradation, and as a consequence, aren't uh, taken apart by proteases. Now, this enzyme plays a role in putting these, this backbone together that includes these D amino acids that you can see right here. The, pe the penicillin molecule has a very reactive ring structure, and as a consequence of in interacting with the enzyme, the ring structure falls apart and it covalently attaches itself to the enzyme, so uh, thereby knocking the enzyme out. Okay. Blah, blah. Here's the reaction. You don't need to worry about the reaction. Okay, does that make sense? No. So suicide does not mean it comes from the cell itself because penicillin uh, does not come from the cell that, 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 would, that would literally be suicide. It's a good, good question. It's suicide because the enzyme is committing suicide. It's binding to something that basically causes it to die. Enzymes are stupid. So they don't know this is good or this is bad. They bind something that fits, and when they bind something that fits, in this case, the thing that fits combines with itself and um, causes this bond to form. And as a result, this enzyme is, is, is dead in the water. Okay? Okay? Yeah? Well, penicillin was not man-made. Penicillin actually came from bacteria. Um, I won't say most, but we do design some to become suicide inhibitors, yes. Uh, but nature is pretty darn good at evolving ways of killing other cells. So one of the active areas of investigation for um, uh, antibiotics is actually examining um, organisms that expel compounds that do inhibit other, other bacteria. So I would say, if we were to probably talk about it, I would say nature probably has mankind beat by quite a bit. One of the things that we're interested in uh, from a biotechnology perspective is um, students frequently ask me, you know, what is biophysics? Uh, biophysics is really the study of the, of the relationship between structure and function. And biophysicists are the people, for example, who determine the 3D structures of enzymes. So one of the things they do is they'll take a purified enzyme, they will use various spectroscopic techniques, and with those techniques they can determine the position in three-dimensional space of every atom in an enzyme that might have 10 or 50,000 atoms. Now, it's an enormous data set. It's an enormous amount of information. But the beauty of that information is you now know where the holes in the enzyme are. You know the exact shape of the active site. And you know the exact dimensions of molecules that you can design for these suicide inhibitors or whatever and put them into that enzyme and kill the enzyme. So that also is a very active area of drug design. And it relies upon that specific 3D information that's, that's, that, that we are rapidly gaining in the laboratory. Okay. Okay. Let's see. So there's penicillin. I think that may be the last of what I have. This the last of what I have there. That finishes up what I want to say uh, about enzymes. I'll move on to our next topic. And I'm actually a little bit ahead, so I'm thinking. If I can get far enough ahead today, we will not have lecture tomorrow. We'll simply have exam, but I'll let you know that better once we um, get further today. Uh, okay. So our next topic is catalytic strategies, and not surprisingly, that's related to what I've been talking about here with enzymes. And it's here um, that... I have to do something that I really don't like to do. And what I don't like to do is something that you guys don't usually like to do either. So we'll, we'll, we'll together do something that we don't like to do, and that's talk about mechanism. Okay? It's important that we have excuse me, a basic understanding of mechanism because mechanism tells us at the atomic level what enzyme is doing. You keep saying, oh, wow, all these different levels at which enzymes are working. This is telling us now at the atomic, at the electronic level, what's happening with an enzyme. I'm not a fan of mechanism any more than you are, but there are certain things that we need to know about mechanism, and what I've chosen to talk about with respect to mechanism are common mechanisms that are used in many enzymes, and you'll see as I go through this that there's a common theme among them, a very common theme among them. Okay. Well, let's look at some of those themes. The first uh, of these 
is something that uh, I've talked about before, which is hydrolysis reaction. I've talked about this before. I've pointed out that proteases use water to split a peptide bond, and that's exactly what you see on the screen. Is an, another example of a hydrolysis reaction. Okay. The enzyme I'm going to focus on today is, or at least in the first part of today, I'll talk about other ones as well. But the enzyme I'll focus on in the first part today is known as chymotrypsin. You've seen this before. Chymotrypsin is a protease, meaning it cleaves peptide bonds. And it cleaves peptide bonds near a variety of different amino acids. Okay. Uh, a couple of them are marked here, phenylalanine being one, thiamine being another. Um, and the general characteristic that these amino acids have that it cleaves next to is that they are fairly nonpolar. They're fairly nonpolar. Okay. Now, um, it turns out that chymotrypsin, uh, when we measure the kinetics of its action, when we see that uh, we cut it at um, one place, it, um, don't see it there. yeah, here we go. When we cut it at one place, it's more efficient than if we cut it at other, no, that's not easy. So, in other words, it'll cut next to, for example, phenylalanine with a different efficiency than it cuts next to methionine. That's not totally surprising because these are very different substrates, and so the binding of these may cause different shapes, slightly different shapes in the enzyme, and some of those may give rise to more effective structures than others do. And we'll see uh, in a second uh, one, of the, one of the considerations uh, for that. Well, it turns out chymotrypsin is, in fact, an enzyme that has a serine in its active site. Chymotrypsin is a sub-example of a class of enzymes known as serine proteases. So chymotrypsin is, is the most common example. The serine proteases are enzymes that cleave proteins, and all of them have a reactive serine at their active site. And we can tell this very easily by treating these guys with DIPF. We treat all the serine proteases with DIPF, and every single one of them will completely lose activity. So there's chemical evidence, first of all, that they have a reactive serine that's in them that's important for their catalysis. Okay. Well, I like to tell the story that biochemists are, by their very nature, lazy people. I'm a biochemist, and I can say that. I'm a lazy person. I want to do things in the easiest way possible. And if I do it in an easy way that's possible, I can get more work done because I, I, I can actually work faster. So studying the breaking of peptide bonds by chemotrypsin is something that um, is not easy to do. If I want to study the, the breaking of bonds of chemotrypsin uh, peptide bonds, I need to start with my starting material. I need to break the bond. I need to isolate the products, which are the two peptides. And that isolation takes a while. Okay. What I'm more interested in is how fast and by what mechanism does hemotrypsin work. So it's an example of a place where if we can find something that hemotrypsin will work on, like it's a protein, and I can easily measure it, that simplifies my work. And so that's what you see on the screen. This is an artificial substrate, and I'm not even going to say the name, which means you're not even going to be responsible for it, but there's an artificial substrate that chymotrypsin will treat like it's a protein. So it behaves just like a protein, and chymotrypsin will, in fact, cleave uh, a bond in this uh, protein. And the bond that it cleaves is, uh, let's see, it's right uh, it's right here, as I recall. Anyway, uh, which doesn't even look like a peptide bond. But suffice it to say, chymotrypsin will cleave this bond. When chymotrypsin cleaves this bond, it splits the molecule into two pieces, just like it did if it were cleaving a protein. But one of those pieces, when it's split off, turns yellow. Okay? Well, yellow color is very easy to measure in a laboratory. I can take a spectrophotometer and measure the absorbance uh, by this material, 
and I can very quickly see how fast this reaction is occurring, right? Simply by measuring how much yellow there is over time. So I can do this, and I can study the kinetics of chymotrypsin. And when people did this the first time, they discovered something that was interesting and unusual about the way that chymotrypsin was working. What they saw was what we see on the next uh, slide, which is this. Now, at first glance, you look at this and you say, oh, well, it's just another hyperbolic plot, et cetera, et cetera. So what's the biggie? Well, the biggie is we're not plotting substrate concentration on the x-axis. Okay? On the y-axis, we are plotting velocity, that is the rate of formation of yellow material. But on the x-axis, we're not plotting substrate concentration. We're not plotting a V versus S. We are plotting how long the reaction took. And notice that we're on the order of milliseconds, which are thousands of a second. So we have to do these measurements very quickly. And when we do that, we discover this thing has what appears to be two phases. A very fast phase that's labeled here as the burst phase. And another phase that's called the, the steady state phase. Okay? Well, as we will see, these two phases correspond to two steps in the catalytic action of chymotrypsin. There's two main steps that happen. And this kinetic experiment gave evidence for the first time that these two steps occurred. It wasn't a matter of cutting a bond and the two pieces floated away, as we shall see. Okay? Well, this evidence then was investigated more carefully, and people, when they began examining chymotrypsin, found some very interesting things. Okay? First of all, they found that Chymotrypsin, during its catalytic action, became transiently attached to a part of the original protein. Transiently. Didn't last very long, but it lasted a little while. It came off, but for a short period of time, a part of the original protein was covalently attached to the serine of chymotrypsin. There's that serine again. You can see it here, you can see it being broken, and that peptide gets released. So in the end, chymotrypsin uh, catalyzes the reaction where it does cleave a bond and both pieces go away. But for a short period of time, chymotrypsin is covalently linked to one of those two peptides. That gave us clues into how chymotrypsin is actually performing catalysis. And now what I want to do is I want to step you through this to under, understand what's happening. This is where we have to put on our spatial mindset and sort of think about this thing in uh, the space uh, of the active site. Having a sort of a three-dimensional uh, image of this in our head helps. And I will tell you that I'm going to say a lot of words about mechanism. And in fact, words are probably not the best way to learn mechanism. I'm going to tell you in words because that's the only communication tool I've got. But I want you to sit down with this and work with it on a pencil and paper. Okay? We're not going to push electrons. You're going to see electrons moving. We're not going to push electrons. I can promise you that. I'm going to try to emphasize this mechanism in the big picture, but I'm going to give you some details I'm going through. Then after I've done that, I will summarize that big picture for you. Okay? All right. So, um, first of all, when we look in the active site of chemotrypsin, we discover something interesting. We discover that there are three amino acids that are brought into relatively close proximity in the enzyme when the enzyme is folded properly. The three amino acids are known as the catalytic triad. And you can see them on the screen. You see that they are aspartic acid, which is amino acid number 102. And no, yeah, I don't care that you know the numbers. You can see histidine, which is amino acid number 57. And serine, which is the reactive serine that I talked about before, is amino acid number 195. Now, the fact that you see those three amino acids close together tell us, first of all, this guy's got to have tertiary structure because tertiary structure has interactions between amino acids that are not close in primary sequence and not close with more than 10 apart. If these guys are more than 10 apart. This guy had to have folded up to bring these disparate amino acids into close proximity. Now, as we will see the mechanism that I'm going to show you in just a minute, these three amino acids work together 
to make a very, very reactive form of serine that causes the catalytic reaction to occur. So they work together. You can see on the screen basically what's happening. Part of this mechanism will involve removal of a proton from serine to make a very reactive ion called the alkoxide ion. And it's that alkoxide ion that actually reacts with the protein. So what I want to do is, before I show you the mechanism, is I want to set up everything that's going to happen, and then I'm going to, tell you this, then I'm going to show you the mechanism and go through the steps. Okay? Give me a chance to get the writing done so I can start that process. Okay, so chondotrypsin is going to cleave a polypeptide. To cleave a polypeptide, chondotrypsin is going to go sliding along this polypeptide, and when it finds, for example, let's say that phenylalanine that it cut next to, it finds that it binds to it. Now we'll see there's a special structure that's a part of the active site called the S1 pocket, and the S1 pocket is where this phenylalanine will bind. If I try to put an aspartic acid into there, it won't bind. If I try to put a lysine into there, it won't bind. But if I put a very nonpolar amino acid like phenylalanine is there, it will bind. Now, binding of something by this enzyme causes the enzyme to do something you've seen happen now many times, and that is the enzyme is going to slightly change shape. Only if the proper substrate binds does this occur. If I have things like aspartic acids that don't bind there, the enzyme doesn't change shape. But the proper binding of the proper substrate causes a very slight shape change in the enzyme. And that shape change in the enzyme causes the geometry between these three amino acids to change ever so slightly. Now I'm going to tell you what happens with those. Okay? When that shape change, I always have trouble saying that, when that shape change occurs, the aspartic acid is moved ever so slightly closer to that histidine. Well, you can see aspartic acid is negatively charged. And you can see that that, that histidine is full of electrons in this ring. We frequently refer to histidine as being an electron sink, meaning it's loaded, that ring is loaded with electrons. The close proximity of electrons over here essentially shift electrons to the right side of this ring, making the right side of the ring ever so slightly more negative than it was before. The histidine is also moved closer to the serine as a result of all these actions that are happening. And this negative charge on this ring attracts the proton off of serine and pulls it off. And you see it being pulled off right here. When serine loses its proton, the oxygen retains the electrons. It remains negatively charged, and that creates what we call the alkoxide ion. That alkoxide ion is very reactive. Now, so far, you haven't seen the polypeptide. The mechanism I'm going to show you shows you the polypeptide relative to these things on the image. But I wanted you first to see what's happening with the positioning of these three amino acids with respect to electrons and the pulling of the proton off of serine. Are we clear on that? Let's take a look now at the mechanism. It's a several step mechanism. I'm going to give you some detail, and then I'm going to come back and I'm going to summarize it for you. All right. Here's the overall mechanism. Okay. Blah, blah, blah. Are we going to have to, first question, are we going to have to draw this mechanism? Okay. The answer is no. Okay. I'm not going to make you memorize how to draw this mechanism. I'm going to summarize for you later the major steps in it. I think you should understand them and maybe even be able to draw one or two of those. But, I'm not going to make you draw all nine or whatever it is, eight steps of this mechanism. Let's talk about what's happening. Okay. We see now the catalytic triad. There is the serine side chain. 
there is the histidine, and there is the aspartic acid. We see a schematic representation of the fact that this polypeptide chain has bound right at the S1 pocket at the active site. Now, people say, well, what's the difference between the active site and the S1 pocket? The S1 pocket is simply a chamber that's right at the active site. It's a part of it, if you want to think about that. Okay. The active site, I like to think of as a cave. And in the middle of that cave, we have hanging out here the catalytic triad. And one of these little bubbles off of the cave is the um, S1 pocket where the side chain, the phenylalanine, is bound. So phenylalanine is just sitting there in the S1 pocket. The alignment of, of the phenylalanine in the S1 pocket now places everything in the right proximity for not only this abstraction of proton, but also for the reaction of the alkoxide ion with the polypeptide chain. That's what happens to break the bond. So, this omits the step of showing you the abstraction of that proton. In fact, when you get to this second step over here, the proton has already been pulled off. The alkoxide ion has already formed, and the alkoxide ion has attacked, you can see it attacking right here, this carbon. This carbon is, um, I, um, uh, I'm sorry, this alkoxide ion is what we describe as a nucleophile. A nucleophile seeks a nucleus. The nucleophile has extra electrons, and it's seeking something that doesn't have so much electrons, and this carbon atom fits this very nicely. The carbon atom doesn't have many electrons because the oxygen has pulled them away. This oxygen right here is very electronegative. It's pulled electrons away from carbon, so this carbon is relatively electron poor. This alkoxide ion is relatively electron rich. Alkoxide ion attacks it, and you can see right over here that the uh, that the oxygen that was there has now made a covalent bond with that carbon that was there. We haven't broken the peptide bond yet because there's the peptide bond, but the peptide bond is getting ready to fall apart. Now there's one other consideration here before that peptide bond falls apart. We have just created a molecule that is very reactive. We don't want that molecule to react with the enzyme because if it reacts with the enzyme, we just created a suicide inhibitor. We'd use this enzyme one time and we wouldn't get to use it again. We want to use it over and over. So to keep that very reactive intermediate from reacting further, it is positioned in something called the oxyanion hole. And all that the oxyanion hole does is it stabilizes this intermediate so it doesn't react with the enzyme. And instead, it falls apart on its own. We see that falling apart over here by virtue of the fact that the peptide bond that was between that carbon and nitrogen now no longer exists. That bond fell apart as a result of this catalytic action. So the steps we've seen so far was that the binding of the proper substrate caused the formation of an alkoxide ion. The alkoxide ion attacked the carbon, creating a reactive intermediate. That reactive intermediate was allowed to fall apart by being contained in the oxyanion hole. When it fell apart, the peptide bond disappeared. Okay, we have just done what I would describe as the fast part of a two-step reaction. Remember I said chymotrypsin works in two steps, a fast step and a slow step. You've just seen the fast step. Now, it sounds like, wow, a lot was happening. Why is that so fast? Okay. Well, it turns out that comparatively to the next step that happens, this step occurs very rapidly. If I had my artificial substrate, at this point, this guy right here where my arrow is would be yellow. I create that yellow very quickly. Moreover, I notice two things here. One, the carbon is covalently attached to one half of that polypeptide that was there. That's a covalent bond right there. This guy is only held in place by a hydrogen bond. That's the other half of the polypeptide chain. And in fact, it goes flying away. There's not much to hold it there. A hydrogen bond is not very strong. And so the first part of the peptide has been released. 
Now, the second part of the reaction that's necessary for the completion of the reaction is the cleaving of the, pep of the bond between this oxygen and this carbon. This step occurs more slowly. Well, what occurs in this step is very similar to what happened in this first step, but not identical. So what has to happen? Well, first of all, we see that water has to diffuse into the active site. That takes a little time. Water has to get here into the active site. Water positions itself. Look at how water positions itself. It positions itself between the histidine and between this covalent bond between the polypeptide and the side chain of serine. Okay? The positioning of this water is very interesting because what happens is this guy here is electron rich. Guess what it's going to do for one of those protons? It's going to pull one of the protons off. It's going to create a reactive oxygen molecule just like we saw with the alkoxide ion. And that reactive oxygen molecule is going to go back and it's going to attack that carbon again. And it's going to create a reactive intermediate just like we saw before. And that reactive intermediate is going to be stabilized in the oxyanion hole. And that's going to allow it to fall apart. And this time when it falls apart, it comes off of the serine. Now at this point, we have released the second polypeptide. As a consequence, the second polypeptide goes flying away. And the enzyme returns back to its original state. Now, it's a lot of words. Like I said, words are very difficult ways to deal with mechanism. But what I want to do before we take a break is summarize for you what I've just described, and then I'll come back and talk about some other uh, catalytic mechanisms. Okay? So what we saw in steps was the, were the following. We saw the binding of the proper substrate in the S1 pocket. That was step one. Step two saw that binding of the proper substrate changed the configuration of the active site. That change in configuration caused the formation of the alkoxate ion. That was step two. So the change in shape created an alkoxate ion. Step three, the alkoxate ion attacked the peptide bond. That resulted in one of the pieces flying away and the other one becoming covalently linked. That was step three. Okay. Step four, we had to release that covalent bond, that, first, that other part of the polypeptide. And in that case, water came in, got activated, that formed that hydroxyl over here that now attacked the bond between the serine and the um, polypeptide chain. That's step four. That bond fell apart. The polypeptide chain got released. That was step five. And everything came back to its original state. So as a consequence of this, we started with something that had a specific three-dimensional configuration. It got slightly changed by the binding of the proper substrate. The um, catalytic reaction resulted in formation of a transiently, transient covalent bond between the um, serine of the, si uh, of the uh, enzyme and one of the polypeptides. But because of the subsequent steps that happened, that polypeptide got released and the enzyme returned to its original state. This is the definition of a catalyst. It speeds the reaction, but it's not used up in the process. Okay? It catalyzed this reaction, but in fact, the enzyme came back to its original state they can go and catalyze more reactions. Now, the players in this that facilitated this happening were the S1 pocket, which is where the, the proper substrate was found, the oxyanion hole, which was where these reactive intermediates were stabilized, and the catalytic triad that, of course, was responsible for making the original alkoxide ion in the first place.
those three things are components of the active site of this enzyme. You're looking droopy? Questions before we take a break? So the oxyanion hole is just a chamber of the enzyme where this reactive intermediate right here is stabilized. The stabilization keeps it from reacting with the enzyme and allows the enzyme to, uh, uh, allows the molecule itself to fall apart. So instead of lashing out and reacting with the enzyme, children lash out their parents sometimes, instead of lashing out and reacting with the enzyme, it has to sort of sit there and I guess go with its own digestive juices and really work itself into a froth and it falls apart as a result of that. Okay? And that happens twice. It happens here with the first break of the polypeptide bond, and it happens down here with the release of the second polypeptide from the uh, serine residue. Both are important. Okay, let's uh, take a brief break, and we will come back and uh, talk about some other related enzymatic mechanisms.